Alrighty, welcome back. In this video, what we're going to start talking about is material covering what atoms and elements are. What are they made up of? How are they put together? How do they make other things? And so we're going to start off at the very beginning here. We're going to talk about what are the elements. And what they are is really the, the purest things in the world. If you go ahead and take a look at our periodic table there, you can see there's all the different elements that there are that we know of in, in the universe, actually. 118 of them that we've discovered. Some of them we discovered. Some of them nature makes all by themselves. But there they are. And so what we're going to talk about is what are those made of? How do we know when we have atoms, elements, things like that? What's going on? So that's what the elements are. They're the purest things in the world. They're the smallest building block of nature. Everything is made up of just these different 118 atoms put together in different ways. That includes me. That includes my pen. Just arrangements of these different atoms. Now one thing that's really important when we're talking about atoms and elements is to talk about their um, symbols properly. So when we look at the periodic table, I'll bring that up again, you can see that on the periodic table each one of the elements has a letter associated with it. If you start in the top left there's an H up there which stands for hydrogen and you go just below that there's an LI that stands for lithium, below that NA stands for sodium. And you'll notice something about that that's really important. The first letter in all of those is a capital letter. So the H is capitalized, the L and LI is capitalized, the N and NA is capitalized. And the next letter, if there is one, is lowercase. And why that's important is because if we're writing out elemental symbols and we want to write out, say, the elemental symbol for cobalt, what we'd write is CO. And that would tell someone we've got cobalt. Now, if on the other hand you made a mistake or you like writing in all caps and you're like, I'm just going to write in all caps in this class, and you go ahead and write CO with a capital O instead of CO with a lowercase o, what did you just do? Well, it turns out what you just did is instead of having cobalt here, which is a nice metal, you have now carbon monoxide, which kills people. And so there's a big difference between writing CO and CO. So we have to be careful. It's always a capital letter and then an optional lowercase letter. And by optional, I mean if it's there, you have to use it. If it's not there, you don't use it. That's what I mean by optional. And I'll give you an example of that. If we look at Na, that is sodium, as we said on the periodic table. And if we look at N, that's nitrogen. So we'd have to put that A there to be able to distinguish Na sodium from N nitrogen. So that's how we write our elemental symbols. And it allows us to know, are we starting a new element or are we talking about the same element by using the capital and lowercase properly? Okay. So make sure to do that all through the semester. So what's next? Well, it turns out that when you take these atoms and elements and arrange them in different ways, um, <clears throat> they end up arranging in what we call groups. Alrighty, so there's the groups of the periodic table. And if you'll notice, there's a bunch of different groups there. And <clears throat> on the left right here, if we start, I'll circle that one, it's called the alkali metals. So if we look at a periodic table, we can see the alkali metals are the ones going down the left. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, those ones down there. We're going to ignore hydrogen for now because he's kind of a special case. Okay? So those are called the alkali metals. So if we ever talk about, oh, the alkali metals, we're talking about that group. Now a group on the periodic table is a column on the periodic table. Now why do we group them that way? Well, it turns out all the alkali metals have very similar chemical properties. If you dump them in water, they're reactive with water and they do pretty much the same thing. Not exactly the same thing, but that's how we group the periodic table. They're grouped by chemical properties. So we go on to the next one, which is called the alkaline earth metals. Now a lot of people get this mixed up because you've got the alkali metals in the first column, you've got the alkaline earth metals. I'm sorry, did I, I say that right? The alkali metals in the first column, the alkaline earth metals in the second column. So the first column alkali, the second column alkaline. And there, if we go to our periodic table, is our beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, radium, and those are our alkaline earth metals. Then we're going to jump over to the right-hand side of the periodic table and talk about the halogens here. Now, what are the halogens? They're the ones 
in the column just to the left of the right-hand side of the periodic table. And if we look here, we're talking about the column that has F, C, L, B, R, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. Those are the ones we're talking about for the halogens. And again, they're grouped that way because they have similar chemical properties. All the halogens react in generally a very similar way. Lastly, on the right-hand side, we have the noble gases. What are the noble gases? They are helium, right? You, you know helium from helium balloons, neon signs, argon, krypton, and the ones down there. We call them noble gases because uh, just like the nobility back in the days, they're pretty useless. And what I mean by that is they don't really do much chemistry. Uh, so the noble gases, they aren't very reactive. You're not gonna go and take helium and react it with anything very easily. So those are the four main groups that we talk about on the periodic table. You'll also notice on the top of the periodic table, if you're looking at it, there are some numbers. So I'm going to circle the numbers here. And there's two sets of numbers. On the left-hand side there, there's a 1, and below that there's a 1a. And this is how we talk about the different uh, groups on the periodic table, not only by their names, but sometimes by their number. The top number is kind of the more modern, it's called the IUPAC standard, and it just says, hey, that first column is column number one. The bottom one is an older standard, 1A, and I just put that on there because you'll see that occasionally, but when we talk about it, we'll talk about group one, group two, group three, group four, and things like that. And you can see overway on the right-hand side, the noble gases are group 18. You'll also notice there's a couple other sections in this where we talk about this one called the transition elements. Now this is not the transition null elements. People get that mixed up a lot. It's the transition elements. And those tend to be the metals that we're familiar with. So if you look at a periodic table, again, you've got in the middle of the transition metals, you've got all those yellow ones, chromium, copper, nickel, zinc, metals that you might be familiar with. Then if you go over here, there's that one in blue, and those poor guys, they have no common names. And there are some names you can find out that are historical that people have used in the past for them, but in general, there's no common name to refer to those groups. So if we want to refer to one of the groups, we're probably going to use one of these numbers up here and say group 13, group 14, group 15, and do it like that. So you need to be responsible for knowing those groups, having those uh, available so you can call and know which one's an alkaline metal, which one is an alkaline earth metal, and things like that. All righty. So, Moving on to a question here, which one of these groups contains barium? We want to know, is it the transition metals, the halogens, the noble gases, the alkaline earth metals, or the alkali metals? And so take a moment and answer that question. So what did you come up with? Well, if we go over to the periodic table and we look down there, we find BA for barium. It's the orange one. It's in group two. And if you remember what group two was called, it is the alkaline earth metal. So hopefully you came up with D. All right, moving on. You don't need to know anything on this slide, but it's interesting. We talked about what the universe is made up of, those 118 different elements, but what are you made up of? And it turns out that we're made up of only a very small number of elements. Um, <clears throat> right? We have carbon in us. We're called carbon-based life forms, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, that's a good chunk of what we are made of. Okay? Now, on the other hand, if you look at what the Earth is made of, um, it's uh, <coughs> made up of not those things. It's, those aren't the primary elements on Earth. So it's interesting, most of what we are made up of is actually trace elements on the Earth. But there's other trace elements, right? Like I said, mostly copper, I'm sorry, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen is what we're made up of. But we also need in blue here, these things that we call macro minerals, right? You might take a calcium supplement. You need potassium, you get that from bananas. Um, you need uh, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, believe it or not. Okay, but we get those normally from our diets if we eat a good diet. There's also these things called micro minerals, which we actually just need a relatively small amount of, but are still important for the functioning of our body. So again, you don't need to know anything of that. It's just interesting to see kind of what elements we need, right? Which means there's this whole part of the periodic table that our bodies really don't need. And it's kind of neat. Alrighty, moving on to the next one. Uh, one other thing we talk about in the periodic table is regions of the periodic table. So we talked about groups, the columns on the periodic table. I also want to mention that the rows on the periodic table are called periods. So the first row that contains hydrogen and helium, that's period one, and the second and the third, and so on and so forth. Okay. On this one, it's talking about the regions of the periodic table. And you can see here in blue on the left, 
it's what we call the metals. So everything on the left-hand side of the periodic table, we call metals. And they have properties of metals like you're used to, right? You can, they conduct electricity, they often shiny, you can bend them easily and things like that. On the top right, up here in the yellow, we have what are called the non-metals. And those have the opposite properties of metals. They don't conduct electricity very well. They aren't malleable, bendable. If you try to hit a diamond with a hammer, what happens? It shatters, so they tend to be called brittle. But what's also really cool is right in the middle, there's these green ones here, which are called the metalloids. And the metalloids sounds like a rock band name, but what it is is it's elements that don't have properties of metals. They don't have properties of nonmetals. They have properties that are in between. So they're sometimes conducting, sometimes not conducting. They can take a little bit of hammering, but maybe not so much. And what's useful for that is things that conduct sometimes and don't conduct sometimes are great for making computer circuits. And so silicon, germanium, those are all things that we find in computer circuits. If you pull out your phone, that's a lot of what's in there. All righty. So just as a reminder, let's do another question here. Which element is in the alkali metal group? Okay, so take a moment to try to answer that one. All righty. So alkali metals, let's go back to our periodic table. Where are the alkali metals? They're in that first group. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Okay, so what do we have on here that satisfied that one? We had lithium right there. So lithium is the alkali metal. All right, moving on. Just a little bit of history about the atom. Right? It turns out we didn't always know atoms and what they're made of and, and how they form. For a long time, people thought there were just four things in the universe, air, earth, fire, and water. Because see, right? you transformed one to the other. When you burned something, it turned into air and fire and water and earth and air. Those were the fundamental things. But it turns out there was this guy by the name of Democritus. Have you ever heard of him? Probably not. But back in 400 BC, he postulated that if you broke things down, eventually you would be able to stop. You couldn't break things down anymore. And he actually came up with a, a, a pretty good theory of the atom. Now, he was a contemporary of Plato and Aristotle, who were just much better at communicating and talking and convincing people. And they thought about air, earth, fire, and water. And so guess what? Our understanding of the universe was set back by about 2,200 years from a guy who just couldn't convince people that he was right. So don't let anyone ever tell you that <laughs> communication doesn't matter. So they thought fire, earth, air, and water for a long time, but eventually they did start learning about the elements on the periodic table, that things were made up of these fundamental things. And then they said, well, these fundamental things, you can't break them down. An atom is an atom. You can't break down sodium into anything smaller. And they figured that out. But then someone did some really ingenious experiments and they found this thing that was a thousand times smaller than the smallest element on the periodic table, hydrogen. And that was what we ended up calling the electron. And it totally upended everything people thought about atoms and, and molecules. Like, how can you break down this thing that's the fundamental way of putting things together? Now, we're not going to go over everything in detail. People did a lot more experiments. And they eventually came up with protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, And they were what were called subatomic particles. Sub being below, atomic, the atom. And they're what made up the atom. And it turns out we have 118 different elements on the periodic table that we know about, but every single one of them is made up of only three things. You're only made up of three things. You're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's really kind of a neat thing, but you combine them in just the right way and you can make all of us. Okay, so what do we know about electrons? What do we know about electrons? Is we know that electrons have a negative charge. Now, what is a charge? A charge is a lot like magnets. So if you have a negative charge, it's kind of like having a so south or north pole and a magnet if it's attracted to a positive charge. They have a negative charge, and they are very, very small. Like I said, they were a 1,000 times lighter than the uh, hydrogen atom. Protons, they have a positive charge. and are much, much bigger than the electrons, about a thousand times bigger than electrons. And I'm going to use a notation here that we sometimes use for electron, which is E minus right there. We sometimes use that as a shorthand for electron. And then there's also neutrons, which have no charge, and are about the same size as a proton. Like I said, everything's made up of just those three things. But what people didn't know is 
how are those all put together? How did we put together those electrons, those protons, and those neutrons to make sodium versus nitrogen or cobalt versus carbon? How is that all put together? And they didn't know. So they did some experiments. There were two primary theories that people were working on back then. One was called the plum pudding model, which just said those things are just in some big soup. These little things are all together. They knew they were much smaller than the atom itself, but they said, oh, just you know, kind of scatter them around. And then there was another model that people thought, well, it actually turns out they didn't think about it until they did some experiments. So what they did to try to verify this plum pudding model is they shot heavy things through here. So if you take a big ball and you shoot it through pudding, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing. That ball is just going to go right through the pudding as if nothing's there. So they did that. They shot balls at pudding. They shot more balls at pudding. And you know, exactly what they thought, pretty much all of them went through. But this weird thing happened. Occasionally, you'd shoot a ball through the pudding, and it would bounce straight back. Now, if you were shooting a cannonball through some pudding and it bounced straight back, you'd be really surprised. In fact, the experimenters were really surprised too. And so they did more experiments and they saw it again and again and again, that a very, very, very small fraction of these little cannonballs, you know, cannonballs on the size of an atom, were bouncing back. Long story short, what they figured out is that the atom wasn't made up of this soup of things. What it was made up of is a very, very, very dense central core that we call the nucleus. That was very heavy. And then these electrons were floating around way outside in the middle of nowhere almost, very, very far apart from the nucleus. So the nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons. Okay. <clears throat> and then the electrons were floating really far around that. It was a weird thing. Nobody expected that, but that's what it turned out to be. And we call this nuclear theory. Now, if you remember President Bush, he used to call it nuclear, but it's not. It's nuclear. And it says this. The atom's really, really small, like smaller than you can possibly imagine, like so small that every time you take a step, you're just walking down the street, you take a step, you're leaving about a billion, billion atoms behind. Not a billion, not like two billion, a billion billions atoms behind. And you can't even see that. That's how small these atoms are. Now, it turns out that the nucleus is even smaller than that. I mean, crazy. These things are so small. The nucleus is just this tiny fraction of the atom. And it's positively charged because it has the protons in it. You remember the protons are positively charged. And it also has the neutrons in it. So it's very heavy. And then the electrons are really, really far away. So we're used to a model where we, we kind of draw things looking like this. There's this nucleus. You might have seen this before, these electrons floating around. But really, if you drew the nucleus as this little tiny dot, I, I couldn't even draw the electrons on this page. They're so far away. In fact, how far away are they? Well, imagine taking yourself, squishing yourself into a little ball. And let's say we scaled the nucleus up to the size of you squished into a little ball. Where would be your first electron? You might think, well, you know, if it's pretty far away, maybe it's at the other end of the room, or maybe it's in, you know, the, the house next to us, or things like that. And that's totally wrong, because it turns out that if you take the nucleus, you scale it up where it's about the size of you, the first electron is almost halfway to the moon. Almost halfway to the moon. In between that is absolutely nothing. There's a nucleus, there's these electrons halfway to the moon, and in between that, absolutely nothing. Which means that you're made up of mostly nothing. How much mostly nothing? Well, it turns out that the atom is about 99.9999999999. I think I got the numbers nines right. Don't quiz me. Percent empty space. Right? So if you're having one of those days where you feel a little bit empty inside, there's a good reason, because you actually are. Most of you is empty space. Now, the problem is, we're like, no, no, I, this pen, this pen is hard. This pen is an empty space. And what we're going to explore as we go on is how do we have this thing that we think is empty space, but things are hard. What's going on in there? So that's what we're going to be exploring moving forward. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.